Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. Before we get to today's episode, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up about the September schedule for Autism Stories. Due to my very busy schedule in September, there are going to be a couple less episodes of Autism Stories. We will have six episodes in September instead of the eight usual episodes. However, we'll resume with our usual eight episodes um, in the month of October. Now on to today's episode, Ashley Jones joins us to discuss supporting neurodivergent adults, playing the flute professionally, and self-advocacy as the way forward. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Ashley, thanks so much for joining me today. No problem at all, anytime. So I'd like to start off our conversation by learning about your story. Where does your story in the autistic community begin? Wow. Probably, I think, after I had a brain hemorrhage about 15 or so years ago. After that, I changed my career drastically. I could no longer, my manual, my fine most skills were gone. So I couldn't keep playing the flute professionally. Um, a friend of mine happened to be working in a special needs school, so I got a volunteer role there, which is my first experience of meeting people who are all autistic. I parlayed that into a full-time career for a few years within the special needs educational the community. And then whilst I was in the last place, basically my first contract was, it was a six-month contract to provide one-to-one support for a named pupil. The end of the six months, I was asked to carry on for the full academic year. So I did that, no problem. But that was a job share role. That couldn't happen for the following year. So I looked around and I found the only place I could find work was a pupil referral unit. So I was working there comparatively happily for a while. And then there was one day in particular there that what the HLTA, I was just a teaching assistant, but the higher level teaching assistant she happened to say to one of our pupils, why don't you go speak to Mr. Jones about this? Because he's got some comparable thing to you. And it happens, this pupil had Asperger's syndrome, and that's why he had come to us in the first place, because he hadn't been able to cope with mainstream. At the time, I thought this HLTA was taking the mickey out of me. But later on, I thought, maybe there is something in it. Maybe she's recognised something in me. So I, ca- I looked into it a bit and thought, yeah, possibly. Short story longer, I quit working there because of this pupil, because we were working really well with him. He was making great progress, but then his mainstream said, can we have him back, please? And we're like, well, you could, but we don't think he's ready to go back to mainstream yet. And we think all the work we've done with him, if he goes back now, it will be lost, and then he'll be permanently excluded. We don't want that for him. Unfortunately, his mainstream said, well, we're taking him back anyway, so he couldn't do anything about that. And lo and behold, a little while later, he came back to us permanently. What is the point? If all the people who know what they're doing are being ignored by mainstream, then how can we actually help these people? This is also because I've done a bit of research about autism at the time, because a lot of our pupils were sort of potentially autistic. I've made a few suggestions to the staff. Could we possibly minimize? We had to put lots of displays up because that's what Ofsted wanted. And I thought, well, everything I've read about autism suggests that this is not going to be helpful to our pupils. It's just going to put them right on the edge. And we're supposed to be helping them. You know, they've come to us to try and get hope with mainstream, which is a separate issue and silly. But the fact that the senior leadership team weren't prepared to make any compromise at all, it's like, well, obviously the CIA had spent a lot of time doing these great big boards of work. And it's like, this is not helping our pupils. So, so I quit that job because it wasn't helpful for the pupils. Anyway, next job I got was as a care worker in supported living accommodation. 
again, I lasted about three or four days there because I couldn't cope with the staff who were there. I moved from there to working for adult social care, which is my best place I've been so far in my life. I got that because of some woman. I first met her shortly after my brain hemorrhage, and she was supposed to help me into work and that sort of stuff. Anyway, I got this voluntary role at a local place to me. I started playing my flute. I was learning to play flute back again because I needed to get my hands working properly. So I started off about one afternoon per week, and that went really well. And so that moved on to two afternoons, a full day, end up being five days a week. So I was doing that. A lot of my customers there were autistic or whatever. Partway through this journey, I began having major problems attending on a regular basis. I was on antidepressants anyway. So I went to see my GP to see if I could get a higher dosage of them. And she said, oh, have you ever been tested for autism? No. Would you like to be tested for autism? If you think it's relevant, by all means. And so she organized for me to be tested for autism. Lo and behold, a few months later, up to, it was relatively local to me at the time, somewhere that they, it was right next to one of the homes that we had customers from actually. Went in for the afternoon from work, got tested. A few weeks later, got a letter of diagnosis. Yep, level one support needs ASD. From then, I've been autistic. I mean, I've been autistic all my life. But sorry, that went on far longer than I intended. <laughs> well, you mentioned it sounds like you've had several different positions, whether they've been paid or volunteer, and um, supporting yeah. neurodivergent people. So w when you think about supporting neurodivergent folks, what are some of the most important things you think about? To be honest, I think it has to be done on their terms and their choice. I cannot be doing with imposing stuff onto them. I mean, I think of it from my perspective. How would I feel if it, somebody did this to me? And it shouldn't be about doing stuff. It should be helping people and listening to them. That is so crucial. This is probably why I don't get on with PBS and ABA, because they don't, in my opinion, listen to the people they supposedly help. Plus, of course, that comes down to trying to cure them of something, which I'm not convinced it needs curing, to be honest. It needs acceptance. But So I think that is vital. I always look for that anywhere I work. I mean, this is why the last two jobs that I left, it was because they were moving towards that way of doing things, which was, it just seems rude to me. You know, these people were coming to us for support, and then we were being asked to impose other things on them. That's not what they're paying us for. You know, it's their money, in my opinion. Yes, it's coming from benefits, but it's still that individual's money. Sorry, I just get quite cross about that sort of thing. But, I mean, it has to be about the individual, ultimately. So really thinking um, about each person's autonomy. It has to be about that. If it's not about that, then what's the point? I mean, I know it's a trite old saying, but when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. I first heard that when I was at this first adult social care. They had a course that they let us all do for free if we wanted to, and to do with autism. So I thought, yeah, that seems like a good idea. I've got no experience in this tour. I'll do with the courses available. And it was a Tizard Sends a Run course. So I think it was probably through Dr. Damien, Damien Milton I first heard it. When you've met one person with autism, you've met one autistic person, end of story. And to me, as an autist myself, that appeals to me, the black and white binary of it. I can relate to that totally. And I just get really frustrated with people who are in the care industry that cannot accept. Yeah, I just get cross, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think supporting others using our creativity, I think, can be so helpful, so impactful. Absolutely, yeah. You know, you've been a caseworker that's used drama and musical theater to support uh, young learning disabled people. In what ways did you see the use of drama and musical theater to be helpful? I think from a personal point of view, having the experience of getting up on stage and acting, that works as a really transferable skill. And so when you're with, and again, in terms of confidence, because quite often people don't have the confidence to say what they need to say. Sometimes by doing that through drama, you can sort of separate yourself from it. I mean, there was one situation, it was me and, I forget the guy's name, but the pair of us were both kind of 
secondary supporters for Starstruck at Choices. The lady who was running Starstruck at the time was off ill. It was me and this other guy were dumped in at the last minute to just run the session the entire morning with Starstruck. So that, the acting stuff, improvising that, was great. And we had one customer there and we asked him what he'd like to do. And he decided what he wanted to do. And he wanted to do some sort of role playing or being interviewed by the police. And this was great. It allowed me to actually acting, just get really angry. And it was a safe environment for all the customers. Having that, being able to just express emotions and I don't know. It was just great from that point of view. Now, you mentioned playing the flute earlier. It seems like music's yes. been a part of your life for a, a long time now. Mm -hmm as you played the uh, flute on a professional level. What is it about the flute that uh, grabbed your attention to the point of continuing to play it that you became you know, very proficient with it? I think it comes down to a number of things. Firstly, for a very long, I think it was my dad who gets credit for this. I think he was on the spectrum too, but I've always been something of an autodidact. So I couldn't cope with at school having to do specific homework that we were given. It's like, I've been in the lesson, I've paid attention, why do I need to do more work? With a flute, I couldn't read music for years properly because I hadn't had my eyes tested. It was only the second flute teacher I had, Sue. She watched me after she had given me something to practice for a couple of weeks and I'd come back and she had me play what I'd been given to practice. Then she gave me a piece of sight reading and she said that I had traveled about the same level. And then she said that she noticed when I played, I would lean right forward to the stand when it got to complicated parts, you know, sort of dead spiders and that sort of thing. And so she suggested I get my eyes tested. So I got my eyes tested. Mummy and Daddy took me out to have my eyes tested, which is brilliant. Got a pair of glasses done. And then I could play through the Berm 24 Caprices on the spot. I've been trying them for years and I could never get it through my head. I mean, I've got them on my stand at the moment because I'm relearning it all. But the fact that you can get books and it's got, I mean, Trevor Wire was a great one. And at the moment I've got Tapping and Go there, daily exercise up. You can just look at the things. It's all there in black and white. If you do this, then you get this result. And that made sense to me. And I could understand that. And I never had a problem with the boredom of repeating stuff over and over again. That just works for my headspace. And so I just really got into it. And my second teacher, Susan Milan, she's brilliant. I went to a masterclass of hers when I was about 15 or so. And at the end of the masterclass, she had made comments to me about teaching me privately. And I mentioned that as I was leaving. And she's like, oh, did I say I'd teach you? And so I thought I misunderstood, left it. Anyway, there was a lady who taught peripatetically at school I was at at the time, who taught flute. But she happened to at some point mention to me, oh, I was chatting to my teacher Sue the other day. She was asking about you. And so from that, I got back into having, well, it was a bit awkward because obviously you can only really have one flute teacher at a time. So I had a chat with my flute teacher. She said, oh no, if Susan Milan's offering you lessons, go to her because she's brilliant. I mean, she was the first lady in England in a symphony orchestra principal role. She's absolutely outstanding, Sue. So I just carried on with her and she was, she got me where most people didn't, she got me. And she actually treated me with respect as a musician, which I don't know, that was just new to me. I was, to be honest, by that stage in my life, I was a huge fish in a tiny pond on flutes at my school and stuff. Nobody was even close to me talent work. Yeah, ta I hate to use the word talent, but nobody had put in the necessary work to get to the level of me. Little things like my first flute teacher had been on at me from donkey years, like banana fingers, banana fingers. And it was from some children's book about if you have your fingers shaped in like a bunch of bananas, they will fit on the flute properly. That stuck in my head. And when I was with Sue, she complimented me on how good my hand position was. It was just the little things that, small things just, it made sense to me with the flute. It doesn't sound like small things. I think those things are, are big things. They probably are big things. Unfortunately, I was treated not very well by most people through most of my schooling because the people didn't understand me. People thought I was just lazy. I mean, there was one time that it sticks in my mind because it was the first time that one of my peers actually said something directly provable to me that was frustratingly unpleasant. We'd had a French test 
and the teacher had accidentally read out a few scores of the test. And so she said, oh, in that case, you're going to have to read out all the scores. So she read them out, got to mine, blah, 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 oh, actually, 97%. And this girl in the class actually said, sickening, isn't it? He doesn't turn up to half the lessons. He doesn't ever do his homework and get marked like that. That is just sickening. And that's the first time I'd understood that this is the thing. People didn't understand. I wouldn't do homework. What was the point of doing homework? I would read the textbook from cover to cover. I would spend hours sat in the study reading, it doesn't matter what the subject is, it's languages, I'll just read the textbook. And that's, I credit my dad with, because he taught me to read when I was very, very little. So he'd be flying around the world on business, and every time he came back, he'd bring back a little book in the Penguin or Puffin Read It Yourself collection. I forget where it, Penguin or Puffin, it's probably the junior version of Puffin or Penguin, I don't know. But he showed, taught me how to read it through his, what he called the lingual phone method, of basically, Read the entire sentence. If there are words there that you don't know, underline them in pencil. Try and work out what the words mean. And go on doing that for the whole sentence. And write down what you think they mean. And see if it makes sense. And then do that whole paragraph and then the whole chapter. And so it went on with that. And I learned to read doing that. And it worked. And that's I've come across that in virtually every textbook I've read. Read it from cover to cover. And underline it that you don't know and check it and work it out that's the thing work it out for yourself only check it in a dictionary once you've worked out because then you have to engage your brain to think about it this is also probably not directly relevant but when i should have been at school i wasn't the reason i still got adequate gcse's was because rather than just bumming around the place i would go to a library or a bookshop and read that's what i did sorry did i just digress totally again <laughs> that, that's all right that's what the podcast platform is, uh, is for we could you know we can talk as long as short as as we want. So as part of your uh, working life, you've been a part of Unison since 2011, which is the largest union in the UK serving the yeah. public sector. So Absolutely. I haven't talked with too many people that have been part of a union. Okay. So I'm wondering in what ways that experience has helped you in terms of finding or maintaining employment as an autistic person? I'm not convinced it actually has helped at all, to be honest. I mean, put this way, the one time I've had any direct interaction with them was when I was working for an adult social care company and they were bringing new contract variations. And so we had somebody, someone from Unison who was attached to our company who came in would chat to us staff and what we liked and what we didn't like and what we were happy with, blah, blah, blah. So he was very useful in terms of just ensuring that they didn't shaft us too much with the contract change. The only reason I joined Unison in the first place was when I first moved to the pupil referral unit, there was one young girl there who was causing major problems for one of the other staff members. And this staff member ended up leaving because of it. And the head of that place suggested that we all got ourselves unionized so if any of the pupils there got shirty with us, we would have the union to back us up. That's the only reason I got involved, and then I just never bothered getting out of it. It's good to be involved, and potentially, I mean, I think it was when I was about to leave one of the places, they were useful to contact to find out whether it was appropriate for me to be leaving or not, because I wanted to check, did I have anything? Were they pushing me out by bringing in this new... Because obviously, during the COVID thing, the actual site was shut. So some of us, like me, Muggins here, went to work at some of the homes where we got our customers from. And I did that for 18 months, not a crisis at all, and it kept me physically doing stuff. When we came back, the powers that be had decided they were changing the thing totally. They now decided that we were trying to move away from institutionalized care. Fair enough, which is a good thing. However, they hadn't thought it through properly. So it was a case of you can no longer bring customers on site. You've got to take them out in the community. Fair enough. And I did loads of work on trying to find out what was available in the local community. At the time, everything was shut because of COVID. So all the various places that would have been available weren't. That was difficult enough. Then they decided that we were now going to also do a uh, sort of carousel where every X number of weeks we would have to go in on a Saturday. Cause we were, I signed up to work Monday to Friday, part of the problem. They then tried to change it so we had to do every few Saturdays. Not a problem with that either as such, other than the fact that at about this time, we had to do compulsory PBS training for physical interventions. 
which is fine to a degree. I thought it was naively at the time. However, they were very insistent, and rightly, I think, that every person, the intervention should be specific to the particular people, which makes sense to me. Unfortunately, some of the people who came to us on Saturday, we didn't have their information. So we were basically stuck in a room with them and said, he has to look after these people all day. Okay, can we have their information, please, and their PBS plan? Uh, we will get into that. I think it was about three or four occasions with one person. I happen to know one of the people that came to us on Saturday from when I'd worked in one of the schools. And this lad had a history of, when I was working at school, he always was two to one. He always had two to one support. He had a history of trying to abscond. Now, no problem with that. However, the training we were given, it was about a half a day maximum for physical interventions. But then we got no specific information on what this particular person needed. And I couldn't work with that. I thought, well, okay, I asked my senior at the time, and she said, oh, we all asked for that. Said, okay, benefit of the doubt, I'll come back next time. I asked again, still haven't got it. So I said, okay, I can't do this. Sorry, it's against this lad's human rights, in my opinion. You know, there was one, and I made a formal complaint about it, which wasn't well received. There was one of the other support workers stood blocking at this, I'm going to call him a kid, he was an adult, but I knew him as a kid and he still looked young, acted young. He was just trying to get out of the door and this other support worker just stood blocking the door, sort of arms folded, like some sort of bound to a security guard. And we all head shaking, I can see you're not in disagreement with us. I wouldn't work in that. And I put in a complaint about this guy, nothing was done. And so I then said, okay, I really need the information about this particular lad because I've been stopping him going out. I haven't physically blocked him. I wouldn't because that's like, that's wrong to my mind. And I would hate it if somebody tried to block me. I mean, I remember I was in hospital. That was horrific. So that's going back to my teens. So I tried to sell them when I was in my teens and I was sectioned, which was not fun. But I recall exactly what it was like not being allowed to leave places. It's like, how dare you prevent me from leaving? And because of that, there's no way that I would do the same thing to somebody else. That's just so wrong, to my opinion. Long story shorter, again, going off on, as you probably figured by now, I can just wrap it on for hours and hours about this sort of thing. But I'm still not happy that A, this poor individual, who no fault is it their own, was blocked. This lad sometimes was in a chair, sometimes not, because he was physically ambulant, but he was physically unbalanced. So sometimes he would get too tight and he'd need a chair. But you could keep him there without having to force him. Just engage with him. And this is the thing that really annoyed me. They were moving away from actually engaging with people. Individual engagement. It's just like tick boxing exercise. No, tick boxing doesn't work. Sorry, but it doesn't. <laughs> and so I left, basically. And that was that for that place. You know, I read something that you wrote recently, um, you know, it's relating to, I think, something that's so important to us as autistic people is advocating for our yeah. wants and needs. And you wrote that self-advocacy is the way forward. So what have been some helpful things for you to advocate for yourself and take to take steps forward in your life? That's a very good idea. My therapist is always saying it's not little, Ashley. Don't call it little. It's still ingrained in me for donkey's years of things to me that I think of as little things, like the fact I've got my current therapist. That was huge for me. That was because I was, I'm trying to find a polite way to say disgusted, but such a word doesn't exist. Last job that I actually was working regularly, I was that close to a complete breakdown. I couldn't cope with the journey in. And eventually they dismissed me. I was still in my probationary period, so they were able to. And the director who dismissed me was very kind about it and very apologetic. It was the 12th of December last year. And she was. She actually said at the time, look, I'm so sorry, this is a terrible time to do it, but we've got to put the business first. Fair enough. Prior to that, when I'd last gone into the place, it's basically so I couldn't be in there for a day, that I've been told by my line manager and her trainee deputy. We hear what you're saying, Ashley. We're the experts here in autism. However, what we can say is that we are not equipped
equipped to deal, to deal with your current issues. You need to get yourself home, ideally see a doctor. If you can't see a doctor, go to a walk-in centre. They will, hopefully, they will send you to the crisis team or put the crisis team in touch with you. Ah, no, that didn't happen. I never make phone calls. I Have you know, read um, Untypical by Pete Warmby? No, I have, but I'm very familiar with it. it. Yeah, yeah. It's well worth it. Yeah. Basically, he describes the whole thing about phone phobia. It's not a phobia. It's a physically, no, I cannot do it. Just the other week, I had to renew my car insurance. And rather than phone them up, I had to. I drove to the place and walked from wherever I parked to the place. I can deal face to face. I can just about cope, but I couldn't cope with making phone calls. So I actually was that determined that I wanted to keep my job because it was a lovely place. I wish I hadn't lost it. Although it's done other good things for me since. However, my surgery couldn't fit me in on that day for an emergency appointment. And I've been told by my line manager, make sure you use the same line that you use with us, the suicidal ideation part. Fair enough. So I did. Still couldn't get over the thing. So I used the proper language with the walk-in centre. The nurse practitioner I spoke to, once she had picked herself up off the floor because she wasn't happy with what I was saying, she went off for a bit and said she could look into it. And then she called me back. Okay, can you get yourself to St. Peter's A&E now? accident and emergency or whatever they call it i can do that take this letter with you and it had all in a letter you know diagnosed with autism suicidal ideation bloody bloody blah, blah, blah needs to be seen asap so i took myself to the nearest a and e st peter's the lady on the door because they were still rationing people going in because they were still practicing their covid related stuff she read the letter and was very apologetic to me and said oh yeah it's terrible isn't it and blah 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 so I had to wait there for about, it was between six and seven hours, I think. And if you're on the spectrum, I'm sure you will relate to the fact that the reception in a casualty unit, OMG, all the lights and stuff, fluorescent lights, all the noise, you skip yourself sat one place and then you have to move because they're trying to bring people. It was horrific. So six or seven hours later, I couldn't cope. So I went to reception. I said, look, hi, this is who I am. This is why I came in. I'm sorry, my autism won't let me stay here any longer. So I'm going. Not because I, want, I felt they had any need to know. I just wanted to, I didn't want them sort of calling my name and sending people to look for me because that would be a waste of resources. So I went home. Full on morning, I managed to get myself an appointment with a GP at my surgery, who was absolutely blinking useless. I've never felt so ghastly in my entire life. Mm. This doctor, I'm going to give her that name because she earned it. But didn't she should have been a surgeon, to be honest, had no real people skills. Basically said, OK, what I can do, I'll write you a fit note to get you. I'll write you a two week fit note, which she did. And she wrote on it two weeks. He cannot work for two weeks due to stress and anxiety. End of that was it. That's all I got. So I passed it on to work who are happy with that. But then it's like, hang on, that isn't solving the problem. I did say so. Well, actually, can I just ask about blah, blah, blah? She was like, no. Little things that I mentioned, like the fact that I was having major trouble sleeping still. And I mentioned the fact that I kept drinking Red Bulls. And she was like, oh, yeah, that's why you can't sleep. But actually, no, that's not why I can't sleep. Red Bull doesn't make me hyper. It's percent of percent me sleep. And she was like, no, that's not possible. That's a rubbish. It's a stimulant. It can't send you sleep. Ah, I've since discovered that it can and does. It's well known. I mean, I'm on the waiting list now for ADHD assessment as well, simply because it's entire. I've got so many of the traits that it could. That might also be. I might be an ADHD. I went back to a GP, but I was this thing I, because it wasn't an emergency as such. I could do it all online, so I can cope with that. I saw a totally different person. I forgot where I was going with this. Where was I going with this? <laughs> I've totally gone down the rabbit hole here. We were talking about self-advocacy and things that oh, have yes. helped you in that area. The fact that I was able to, through off my own bat, find a therapist that was work used to working with MDs. Nobody told me how to do this. However, when I was working for another company that I also quit because I didn't like their PDS system, and also I had a huge issue with that company. Point being, I spoke to somebody before leaving the last job I chose to leave, and this person, I looked online, or no, I've 
had recommended from a notice board where I was working, this person's good at that. And I spoke to them on the phone because they offered a free consultation. And at first I thought, oh yeah, this person's really good. They understand it. And they'd, they'd explain that I had a child who was on the autism spectrum. So I'm like, okay, this person probably does have a good chance of knowing all about it. That's going fine. And at the end of the, well, near the end of the session, she said, yeah, I mean, we're all a bit on the spectrum, aren't we? No, we're not. And that was just hearing that I almost exploded on the spot. When I did my autism champion training for one adult social care place, which was a brilliant piece of training, also organized by the Tisdale Center originally, just the fact that no, everyone's not on the spectrum. I mean, my mentor in that, Jane Gupta, she was brilliant. She had this thing, it's a bit like, have you got a broken leg? It's a total black and white binary. Have you got a broken leg? Yes, no. Are you autistic? Yes, no. End of story. Yes, it affects different autists different ways. However, if you're autistic, you're autistic. And that's it. It's not curable. Well, current thought is that it's not curable. I think it's not curable. And then again, why should it be curable? I'm more of feeling that let's make society accept us more. Because surely that's the way to go. Also, this again might be a bit of a tangent, but how does it help children for a start? I mean, I think in a way it's good that kids these days can get early diagnosis. I was diagnosed in my late 30s. I had all my growing up, I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and that was it. And I spoke to psychiatrists, goodness knows how many years as a child. It never occurred to me, it never occurred to them that I might be on the spectrum. Back then, it was seen to be, I was treated with cases, oh, you can't be autistic, you're too clever to be autistic. What? I just didn't get, but also that was a thing that was, at the time it was horrific. I was assigned to run a group at one place I was working called an advocacy group. And I spoke to all the customers in it and me and the lady who was running the group with me, in the end, we thought, well, all our customers have said, no, they don't want to have this group. They'd rather just have it as a social interaction group. And because I was naive, I thought, well, if that's what the customers want, and they're paying us for the service, they get what they pay for. They want to have a social interaction group, that's what we'll do. So I spent donkey, well, a long time designing this whole carousel of we could have one week of doing X, Y, and Z that one customer liked, another week of doing X, Y, and Z that another customer liked, and just carousel it round. That was going to be that was working perfectly until somebody called me and this other worker into a private meeting to explain that actually every site has to have an advocacy group. Okay, fair enough. So we had to change it back to an advocacy group, which worked perfectly in the end because we'd had time to get to know the people by then. It was difficult sometimes setting it at the right level for the customers so that it could improve. It's frustrating. We had one girl towards the end who had very poor communication. This is when we were running all on Zoom. Can you imagine that? You've got an advocacy group you've just about got sorted and then it's shut down for 18 months and you've got to restart it on Zoom. So you've got to not only help people to run Zoom, which you don't know how to use yourself, really. So you've got to learn on the job. And, it's, and that was like, my goodness, that was truly effing hilarious at the time. Well, in a very, that's not appropriate way. There was basically one Zoom license and the whole of the company. So if you wanted to run a session, you had to put it through a certain thing. Little things that amused me in terms of the um, way that company used to run its stuff. I always still had my name down as running an advocacy group once a week, about six months to a year after I'd left. I had to get in touch with them after I'd left, say, by the way, I'm still getting this coming through on email. Can you please sort that? Because the customers who were able to do it would go online because this is what I'm proud of. A lot of my customers couldn't go online before this, but they learned, they had to learn to go online and use. That was another thing advocacy-wise that really made me cross during the COVID thing. Before we actually shut down, I would drive into work and I would hear on the radio when the whole COVID thing was starting, all these things saying, oh, blah, 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 blah. For more information, go online, which is fine. I'm thinking, well, this is great if you can go online. But then again, a lot of my customers, could go online because either they were sort of 
they've been coming to us for about 40 plus years and were properly of the borderline retirement age realizing and didn't understand computers or where they were living didn't have access to internet i mean where i worked when i was deployed to the four houses technically each of the houses was internet connected but it was such a poor connection that the general staff at the houses didn't let the customers use it it's like hang on a minute so i had to go online so i could check whether the customers were paying for internet that's lo and behold they were so i had to kick up for the customers about that that's just basic sorry but if you're paying for something it needs to be provided you know if you can't use it yourself and you're paying for it somebody that is paid to support you needs to help you to operate it little things there was one guy that i worked with them i worked with them they were in my first key group at this particular place and i then by fluke chose to work in their house during that they made huge progress while i knew them from having no real communication with anyone to actually communicating and properly advocating for themselves like great mate literally this person very 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 institutionalized autistic and had very very set routines they've been living at this house since before it was there they've been living in its predecessor they've been in this place for 40 50 years were so used to their set routines couldn't function without their set routines i was chuffed with the fact i was able to encourage them very very gradually little things like when i was running what was the group it was an offshoot of the self advocacy group on a friday morning when we were back on site or something like that and it was just a few had about four five customers maximum and just playing board games and stuff like that and discussing things like stuff from the advocacy group healthy eating that's what I was came back we had one large gentleman who was technically he was legally blind he went to a blind school he was great at reading braille he was very very obese and had major diabetic issues so it seemed like a sensible thing to help them to learn about healthy eating because let's be honest healthy eating is important ultimately for anyone that's if you're trying to encourage people to live alone and be able to support themselves they've got to be able to eat sensibly which is something i still struggle with that second issue do as i say not as i do but yeah so we go through this sort of this lad who had been in i say lad he was way older than me but he everywhere he went he had a pad that he took with him it was a samsung galaxy pad which i had to be careful with because obviously part of what i did there was changing people whose pads need to be changing anyway he wants to bring his pad with him so okay you can come down and you can bring your pad with you okay how about we try just don't have the pad for say 5 minutes just for this session and after 5 minutes you can have it again how did that go for you you okay with that my friend okay he tried it and then another one of the customers asked if he could use it and so i asked this customer oh is it okay if so and so uses your pad for a bit just for a bit okay so that was sorted Anyway, by the end of the session, he'd forgotten about using the pad. And so I asked him if he wanted it back. I, oh yes, as he had it. Directly following that, he went and spoke to another member of staff to ask if he could join their group, which went out. It's like and everyone was so shocked. It's like, hang on, this guy's actually made huge progress. It took a good 2 or 3 years building to this progress, but to me that was huge. He'd actually advocated for himself. He'd gone and he'd asked another member of staff who was known to take groups out, could he join their group? Now this customer was known for never going off site when he come to us he stayed on site end of story but he'd actually achieved that to me that was huge and that's what to me it was all about helping people to make progress for themselves cuz i didn't do anything with that i just supported him very gently and gradually over the years and i did have to stand up to him a few times when people like oh you can't just let him do that cuz they brought in an idea after a while that they had to change the computer sessions it couldn't just be playing games okay well for me you can't just do that to somebody that's been coming to you for 30 40 years you can't overnight get it changed so what i did with him was i tried to okay try this game and try this game and let's put it onto games that required more thought as such so i moved him away from the things that were just simple to games that would actually require him to use his brain a bit more And so I would play them with him and that worked brilliantly actually parallel play worked brilliantly 
which again, that seems to be a really important thing to me. You know, parallel play or parallel work, you don't have to be doing the same thing. If you're just working a lot physically there with somebody and just doing one thing next to them, that can provide, that can be really beneficial, I find. Which again, just my experience, I've always got to be careful because I've got in so much trouble online in recent times with offending people. But I think parallel work can do great things. And I only base that on the fact that for this one particular person, it helps them to self-advocate and therefore job done. As my mentor suggested when I was doing my Austin Champion training, what we're trying to do is put ourselves out of the job. We're trying to help these people become independent so they don't need us. And that, for me, is ideal. I like the idea of putting myself out of work by helping people to not need me. Yeah, and then lastly, Ashley, how can our listeners learn about you and connect with you beyond this interview? Beyond this interview? Um, well, it depends. If they want to follow me on LinkedIn or if they want to connect, they can ask to connect with that. And the chances are I'll probably say yes. I'm on Insta, Ashley Jones, 1641 and technically i'm on facebook as just ashley jones i don't go on facebook as much as i used to but i have found there are great resources on facebook embrace autism i found to be a very useful resource i found so many people also i've got to say this before anyone says anything else if you haven't read it and you like reading untypical by pete warmby trust me it's a great book to read also by him what i want to talk about it speaks to me his way of writing it just connects with me i think that's about it at the moment for well ashley i really um enjoyed meeting you thanks so much for making time to uh, talk with me today absolutely no problem if everyone wants to chat again feel free to get in touch no problem at all next time i'll try and be less verbose Thanks so much to Ashley for the conversation. To learn more about Ashley, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. Here at Autism Personal Coach, our clients are the experts, our coaches are the guides. The majority of supports for autistics are not helpful. They try to fix us, not support us. That's why many are confused when we say our clients are the experts, experts of their lived experience. Our clients are the experts for what has worked for them and about the things that they need and want in their lives. Our coaches first listen to our clients and then ask thoughtful questions, offer resources, and strategize with our clients so they can get what they need to thrive. Would you want a guide in your life to coach you to get you the things you desire? If so, then visit autismpersonalcoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.